to go ahead and get started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dave Lytle. Um, Dave Lytle got his PhD in 1999 from Cornell University. Um, and uh, from there went to do a postdoc at, uh, or he, he went to do a postdoc at the University of Chicago. And then he was a Smith Fellow at the University of Arizona. Um, since 2000, is that right? 2002. 2002. He's been at uh, Oregon State University. Um, and uh, he's now an associate professor as of last year. Um, and today he's going to tell us about some of his really interesting work uh, studying flood regimes uh, and their effects on aquatic insect populations. So with that, I'll give it to Dave. Well, thanks, Louie. Thanks for hosting me. And it's wonderful to be here and to, to meet everybody. Um, I don't need to repeat the title there, but uh, you can see that uh, some of the things that I'm interested in are flooding and drought and the effects that these events have on primarily aquatic insects, but I'm also going to delve into the world of plant ecology a little bit, so it'll be, it'll be interesting. An entomologist talking to other entomologists about a little bit of plant ecology, so we'll see where that goes. Um, but you can see from the wording that I talk about extreme events shaping populations, and the reason I chose that wording is that some of the stories I'm going to give you are ecological and some are evolutionary. And I think that there's a very fine line in between the two and that, that, it, that it, it's interesting to study how these abiotic dynamics, flooding and drought, shape both ecology and evolution and where that break point from one is uh, to the other. So here's just a little bit of motivation from a conservation point of view for why should we should be interested in these types of phenomena. Um, I'm preaching to the choir here. I mean, we're in the Central Valley, a place where water is incredibly important and incredibly over-allocated. Uh, I don't think that that's atypical for the rest of the world. And in fact, if you look at the numbers, you can see, first of all, that in the United States, most rivers have been modified in some substantial way by dams, diversions, channelization, what have you. Uh, and there are also many other water control structures alongside of that. Uh, such as diversions and dams. And this is fairly typical uh, uh, on a worldwide scale, and it's changing more towards the United States type of model, uh, even as we speak. And as biologists, we're interested in this because it results in a number of impacts, such as the homogenization of flows, the re reduction of flood flows, and the reduction, in some cases, of drought flows. Physical fragmentation of populations uh, changes to the, the nutrient regime and the, uh, the biotic dynamics that occur in river systems, and just overall a community simplification. Uh, and if you have a simplified environment, fewer things are able to live there in general. Um, you can see this if you look at a historical hydrograph such as this one from the Green River in Utah. And the way to read this is we have, we're going through time here on the x-axis from the 1930s up through uh, near, close to the present. And over on the, the uh, y-axis is the water year, so starting in October 1st and then going through an annual cycle. And what you see visually right away is that prior to the Flaming Gorge Dam being constructed in uh, the early 1960s, the Green River would have a long period of drought during the late fall and early winter where there's just not much flow going through it. And then as soon as spring snowmelt hit, you'd have massive uh, snowmelt runoff peaks resulting in large floods over there. And pretty much all of that has changed because of the uh, way the dam is managed for users downstream. Uh, water is captured in the winter months and only in the most extreme El Nino years do real flood events get by and uh, cause downstream flooding. And it's doled out uh, during the rest of the year for agricultural and municipal uses downstream. Okay, so we've truncated the extreme events off. We've cut off the high floods and we've also elevated those low base floods. And I think that this type of hydrograph is certainly typical of streams in the arid western states and uh, for a lot of different streams and more music environments as well. And I, ha I had to throw these in because I just took them from, a, from field work recently. This is the Gila River in Arizona. And uh, it just shows what some of these water withdrawals look like. Uh, water is being siphoned out near a dam site and put into irrigation ditches and transported out uh, primarily for agriculture. So this is, again, a scene that you see in any region that is, is heavy on uh, agriculture, such as the Central Valley in California. 
Well, you know, the ecological problems that these types of water management cause is, is not lost on people, and uh, so there's a lot of movement toward prescribing ecological flow prescriptions for restoring some of the ecosystem attributes of flooding and drought. So restoring some of that variability to river systems. And uh, this is the Bill Williams River in Arizona, which probably most of you have not heard of, but it's a major river that's a tributary to the uh, Colorado River uh, in, the, in the lower part of it and drains a substantial portion of western Arizona. And the nice thing about it is that uh, there's one dam on the reservoir and there's a lot of interest in restoring some uh, ecological flows downstream. So in conjunction with the Army Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife, and the Nature Conservancy, uh, a number of scientists, including myself, have been able to study what happens when you, when you have one of these flood releases, what the impacts are and how the organisms respond. Okay, so just some quick uh, definitions of the terms that I'm going to end up throwing around, uh, so I might as well get them out, out of the way. When we talk about a flow regime, we can break it into these constituent components, such as the magnitude of an event, you know, how big it is. Uh, how, you know, what was the peak CFS or, or cubic meters per second of a flood event. The frequency of events, so how many of those types of flood occur, floods occur during a year. Uh, the predictability, this is a more subtle concept right here. So predictability can be defined in a few different ways. It can be, I define it as the correlation of events, such as flood events, with another cue. And that other cue can be something like the timing within the season, or it could be individual rainfall events. And we'll see that ecologically and evolutionarily, both those types of predictability do matter for organisms. And of course we have timing, the date during the year when it occurs, and the duration, which is simply the length of the event. Um, I would like to make the point here that these disturbance events, in addition to having ecological effects, also have evolutionary effects that are measurable and studyable. And what this graph shows here, this is, uh, these are results derived from a life history model that asks the question, how strongly would you expect a phenotype to evolve, in this case a life history, to evolve? under different uh, dynamics of, of flood predictability, <coughs> magnitude, and frequency. And it just, it just turns out that magnitude and frequency are additive in this model, so I've sort of collapsed them into a single axis right there. But the upshot is fairly intuitive. If you have events that are highly predictable, meaning you know when they're gonna, going to occur, the organism can anticipate them, because they always occur during a certain time of the year, very narrowly, or are correlated with some certain other event. Okay, so if you're way down here on this axis, and they're big, meaning they actually cause problems for the organism, meaning potential mortality, and they're frequent, meaning they occur uh, a relatively high number of times within the lifespan of that organism, and that puts you down in this corner, and you're going to expect the strength of selection on this axis to be relatively strong. And of course, this scales with the lifespan of the organism, because uh, a disturbance to a cottonwood tree is going to be a different kind of disturbance than one experienced by, say, a, a small mayfly or something with a rapid life cycle. Okay, so conceptually, we can imagine that there's some ecological space where disturbances may kill organisms, so they'll have ecological effects, but there's not necessarily evolution. But in this corner, we expect phenotypic evolution in response to the disturbance to occur. That's sort of a framework there. Well, as you might have guessed by now, my disturbance of choice is flooding. And in particular, uh, ever since the beginning of my PhD work, I've had study systems down in southern Arizona where I study the monsoon flash floods that occur there, starting about uh, July going through August and September. So these are very intense floods that are of very short duration. Uh, and in fact, here's just one example. A typical canyon stream might consist of a little bit of base flow and pools connected up with a, a small amount of flow. But during one of these monsoon events, the whole system can be flooded out. And as you might imagine, the potential for mortality for aquatic insects there is quite large. Um, not surprisingly, aquatic organisms have evolved various strategies for surviving these uh, flood events and to some degree drought events. And this is one of the mechanisms or machines, I'll call it, that we use for studying uh, flood events. This machine 
or, or this, this pump system right here takes water, recirculates it through a spray nozzle, and actually creates monsoon rainfall. And it turns out that a lot of aquatic insects cue into that rainfall as a signal to move out of that habitat and thereby, thereby avoid flash floods. So we can set this up where we'll put aquatic insects in this bin here, put a control group in there, uh, flip a coin, see who gets the rainfall, and then measure what kinds of behaviors uh, ensue after a certain amount of rainfall. And just to give you a sampling of some of these kinds of results, uh, this water scorpion over here, we get about a 78% response rate uh, compared to controls, which rarely come out. And they come out quickly. It takes about 10 minutes of rainfall for them to be convinced that something bad, such as a flash flood, is going to be correlated with that rainfall event. Uh, water striders literally jump out of the water and stay out. They're very, they're, they're very good at dealing with this, very reliable. Response time of less than two minutes. Um, other things either don't do the behavior or do it differently. Uh, this diving beetle, uh, we could never get it to come out of the water with these rainfall trials, but one day when a real storm actually went by and the barometric pressure dropped, all the individuals in both control and treatment tanks went flying out. So clearly there are other mechanisms besides rainfall that organisms such as aquatic insects use to escape these floods. So this is just a little sampler for you. I'm going to get into more detail later with, with specific case studies. Um, it also seems to be the case that there are behavioral responses for flow variability in the general sense. So very often, in, especially in really sandy bottom braided rivers, you'll have a flood that activates a lot of side channels and may wash individuals off into those side channels. Then those begin drying up over the course of the next day or two. And it turns out that a lot of aquatic insects are pretty good at finding their way back to the active channel. And in this little bit of natural history observation, we saw this happen where as this side channel was drying up, we saw thousands of these long-toed water beetles uh, slowly marching upstream towards a more perennial reach. Okay? So they were going in the direction where flow was coming from. And concurrent with them, but buried beneath the substrate so you cannot see them, although you can see some of their tracks over here, are these um, sand dragon uh, dragonfly larvae. So these are progonthus larvae that have these fossorial legs for burrowing. So they're actually burrowing in the same direction uh, upward. So clearly there, there, there are little tricks, behaviors, and even life histories that aquatic insects have for dealing with this kind of flow variability. OK, so that's just the backdrop. Uh, the structure of my talk is sort of centered around this goal. So what I want to do, in a sense, with this research program is predict both ecological and evolutionary responses of aquatic organisms to these altered flow regimes. And the philosophy or the approach that I'm taking is that I'm going to present to you a number of different very simple either ecological or evolutionary models that uh, take basic biology and combine it with something about the hydrograph, the hydrological dynamics, okay, which I think is the key to understanding these processes. I'm focusing almost entirely on abiotic processes. Okay, so it's the organism against that abiotic world. I almost never model in biotic interactions in between species for these models, just because I want to see how far we can get at explaining the system by just, in, just uh, invoking those abiotic processes. And in general, I'll begin as simply as possible with fundamental vital rates and, and ignore more complex bits of biology that could be interesting, but um, you know, best to start simple first. So that's the general approach I'm going to take. And I'm going to present three different examples. The first is uh, dam releases from the Bill Williams River and uh, modeling aquatic invertebrate population dynamics. So this is work in conjunction with one of my PhD students. Uh, modeling riparian plants in managed rivers in conjunction with another uh, collaborator who's a riparian plant biologist. And finally, looking at the evolution of insect flood escape behaviors under different uh, flow regimes. Okay. So again, this this first uh, problem that I'm looking at, this is Laura McMullen, who's a, a PhD student who's responsible for, for most of this, uh, the interesting parts of this next little piece. Um, she's been working in the Bill Williams River and building models that understand what we call these countervailing dynamics of flooding. So floods do two things simultaneously. They're good and they're bad for organisms. So they're good in that they 
pulse in nutrients that are important for a lot of aquatic insects. They scour out fresh substrates, which uh, a whole suite of aquatic insects require to complete their life cycle. And they also remove habitats that may be unfavorable for certain species. Uh, at the same time, they kill you. You know, they cause mortality. We know that. Uh, they also displace individuals downstream uh, or laterally into, into habitats that may be suboptimal. So these, these effects are occur occurring simultaneously, and the, and the trick is to capture those dynamics in a way that uh, allows us to say biologically meaningful things about the system. And the way that we've chosen to do this is to begin with very simple models of population growth. This is essentially logistic population growth here. I mean, you have this in your undergraduate ecology class. And you remember you have the intrinsic population rate of increase, which is R. Uh, you have some carrying capacity, K. And uh, N is simply population time. And when you solve that equation, the solution gives you that, that nice uh, saturating curve where you have a, a curve that ramps up and then slows down and then, s and then slows down at a population size that approaches K. Okay, so very well understood, very simple. What Laura has done is gone ahead and relaxed a lot of the relevant assumptions to pull in parts of the hydrograph and part of the uh, abiotic ecology that are relevant to these organisms. So she's allowed K, the carrying capacity, to become a function of uh, the different flow regime dynamics. So KS is now is the carrying capacity limit following the large flood. So that's like how big your carrying capacity could get if the ideal flood occurred on the river and then you were able to grow in that habitat. KL is sort of the opposite. That's what the carrying capacity should look like if floods just have, do not occur on that river anymore. Okay, and so these are all these things like riparian or vegetation growing in, uh, nutrient cycles changing as a result of flooding or a result of a lack of flooding. And essentially, uh, this is just one of the many equations that she's put into this. So I'm only showing you a partial model here. Okay, so those of you following this closely, uh, there are other parts to the modeling that I'm not showing you right here. But the gist is, is that she relaxed assumptions about what K means, and uh, to some degree also relaxed assumptions about what starting population sizes look like. Because remember, floods cause population sizes to get diminished as well too. So. <coughs> We've sort of examined this model with a few different life histories in mind. The first is a fast life cycle organism, a mayfly, which does really well on these freshly scoured substrates, rapid life cycle, and they get in, back into the stream really quickly after floods. Okay, so really rapid life cycle, kind of a weedy life cycle. Next we have sand dragons, uh, Promalthus borealis. So these require uh, they like post-flood habitats and that they need open sandy habitats, but they have a slower life cycle from a month, months to a year, depending on how you measure it. And they also have behaviors for surviving floods that I showed you before. So they're able to get back into the active channel after being displaced by floods. So they've got some advantage there. At the other end of the extreme, we have ostracods, which essentially are pond species, more or less, at least the species that we study. And they have very poor survivorship during floods, so they're high mortality. They prefer habitats that tend to occur when floods are rare in a system. And in our system, that means beaver ponds uh, and uh, sort of slow areas along the river margins associated with uh, aquatic macrophytes. So things that come in slowly after floods have been absent from the system for a few years. So this is a typical model run just to get, get for you to get a sense of what the uh, output looks like. So uh, starting over here, we've started all of these populations at a relative population size here as if floods had not occurred on that system for a long time. So the ostracods are doing great here. They're at pr pretty much the maximum that they can do. Uh, the mayflies and the dragonflies have been suffering for a number of years. They're down at 40%, which in this case is the minimum uh, value of K. And you can see immediately that this first flood uh, changes conditions so that the growth rates increase rapidly. But the important thing to note here is that actually a series of floods uh, creates an even better situation for some of them. So if you look at the, um, for example, the gray line, the mayflies, each time there's a flood, they experience mortality. But the growth rates are getting better and better and better because the environment's being enhanced. So there's sort of a trade-off between immediate mortality due to flooding and enhancement of the environment, which is allowing a higher carrying capacity to be achieved. 
then of course at some point if you leave off flooding things are going to revert back to the state that, uh, that had been occurred previously. So the upshot of this and I should note here that we have three years worth of data uh, from actual uh, prescribed floods in the Bill Williams River that we're using to test this model and calibrate it in a more refined way. I'm not going to present that right now. Uh, Laura's in the process of, uh, of working that up as we speak. Um, but you can ask some more theoretical questions using just the data I've shown you thus far. And in fact, one big management question is how do you allocate water? If you have a big dammed river and you want to restore ecosystem function, do you send out a single large flood? Do you do many small floods? Um, and of course, this depends on your management objective, right? And maybe you want to favor some species over others. And you know, there's no easy answer here, but the thing is, from a type of modeling exercise such as this, you can create these surfaces. So here you have relative population size. So they're doing really well, or doing really poorly right here. Uh, this is cumulative flood magnitude. So all the flood events that we're modeling right there, that's the cum cumulative amount of water that we've used up. And this is the number of floods. Okay, so if you have a really high flood magnitude out here, and one, this is one giant flood down in this corner. Okay, down in this corner, it's many very small floods and all points in between. And here we're looking at a snapshot for mayflies, dragonflies, and ostracods 20 days post-flood, because we just have to choose some sort of time period to look at here, unless you want to go to four dimensions, uh, and 100 days post-flood. And I don't want to get too much into the details right here, but for most of these species that seem to like floods, there's, uh, such as Gompens and Falcyon, there's some space in the middle where they tend to do really well over both the short term and the long term. So they don't like floods that are too small, they just don't have an impact on the growth rates of the population, but they don't like the really huge floods either. In fact, you can still see some of the lingering effects after 100 days right here. So there's some optimum there in the middle, and what we can do with this kind of modeling approach is find uh, some compromise optimum for multiple species, and in fact, even find uh, flow regimes that will disfavor things like ostracods if that's not something that you want in your ecosystem. Okay. So I'm just showing this as a general way to model how to optimize prescribed flow regimes given that you have multiple species in the system. And again, there's no competition, no biology going on among those species. So the utility, I've already sort of hit these points already. So in theory, we can make multi-species predictions and management scenarios. Uh, we can even forecast things such as climate change scenarios, which are expected to change the amount of water that's available to use as well as the uh, timing of its distribution in the system. And I think the most interesting thing is that we can actually design flow regimes, so cycles of flooding, that favor certain taxa over others. And especially when you start thinking about native versus non-native species, uh, certain species of high conservation value because of their ecosystem services and so on, there's a lot that can be done there. But we uh, you know, still haven't really validated the model. We have some, some output from it right now. Uh, it seems to be performing reasonably well, but I don't have details on that yet. And there's the open question of whether we need to have more detail in there in terms of the biology, biotic interactions, or even things like seasonal dynamics. Okay. So now I'm going to move on to the next example that's similar in a lot of ways. Um, except instead of looking at these growth trajectories, we're looking more at life history dynamics of two species of high conservation concern in most western rivers. And these are native cottonwoods, uh, which in this case is the Fremont cottonwood, and the invasive species tamarisk. And you know, people have, you know, biologists have known about this for a long time, that if you look at uh, the window of seed set for cottonwood, uh, versus tamarisk, there's a, a nice little window of opportunity there. So just some general biology. All of these riparian species need freshly scoured substrates to uh, reproduce uh, with new seedlings, okay? So the typical cycle is there'll be a big spring flood. It'll scour out new areas for, uh, for seeds to land on, and those seeds hatch into seedlings. And if the water table goes down at a favorable rate, you can get really massive recruitment of beds of seedlings. And the key here is that populace, cottonwood, sets seed, in general, a lot earlier than tamarisk. 
Okay, so it's, it's thought, okay, well there's a window there, we can exploit that. If we want to have more cottonwood forest and reduce the amount of tamarisk recruitment, uh, then we can have prescribed floods that occur just during that populous window and then ramp down and then by the time tamarisk is set and setting seed, all the establishment has occurred and so tamarisk won't be able to get a toehold. Okay, so that's sort of the, the theoretical thing that a lot of biologists have shot for and this is I don't even remember what this is a hydrograph from here, but uh, this is this is a, a high, you know th that type of ideal hydrograph designed to achieve that uh, on a managed river. And so what Dave Merritt and I, well actually before I get into that, so here it is visually. So here's the Bill Williams River. Uh, you can see that this whole area was scoured out by a flood here. This area had been scoured out by another flood, and what you see is massive recruitment of cottonwood and tamarisk. Okay, so those, this flood occurred when both were setting seed, which is you know, a little more typical situation. And so you have a mixed stand of the two species. And you can see further back, there's development of more mature stands that are the result of previous floods in previous years. And we parameterized our approach for the Yampa River in Colorado, which is one of the few undammed rivers uh, in the western states that has really good intact cottonwood forest. Um, and you can see that sand development here. Young ones here, kind of middle age classes here, and the old uh, gallery forest a little bit further back from the active river channel. And again, these are, these are really active rivers that uh, keep jumping in and out of their floodplains. So an area will get scoured out, the river will move over here, scour out another area. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of dynamic movement uh, and a lot of spatial uh, dynamics um, to the way that the, hy the, the, the hydrograph moves the river around in that landscape. And, you know, I'm kind of jumping into riparian tree biology here, but our model is sort somewhat predicated on what's called the recruitment box model uh, by Stuart Rood and colleagues that have been developed over the past uh, 10 or 15 years. And essentially, they noted that recruitment only occurs when certain conditions are met for riparian plants. So there has to be a flood that creates bare substrates, there has to be seed release going on, and also the <coughs> flood recession has to be favorable for root growth, because the roots have to actually track the decline in water table. And so when, when you're in that zone, so this is through time here, and this is the, uh, the recession of the flood, you're going to get recruitment of say cottonwood uh, seedlings in this case, or maybe some other species in this case, depending on whether that box of recruitment falls in the right timing of the year and in the right place in the hydrograph, okay? So you just need those things to align in order for recruitment to happen. And so what we did is we used a simple population projection model, sort of a matrix model, to uh, first model cottonwood and uh, then model tamarisk uh, in those same habitats. And so you might recognize this from a sort of a basic uh, ecological modeling course where you have these different categories. You have seedlings, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, so on, and then these larger bins that include uh, six to 10 years old, and then the reproductively active 10 plus year old cottonwoods. And there's some probability that you're gonna live from one stage to the next, and at least for some of these categories, some, some probability you're gonna stay in that category for a period of time. And then there's fecundity, which is reproduction up there. And essentially what we did is say, okay, your chances of survival are gonna be dictated to a large degree by the hydrograph. So those transition probabilities become related to whether it was a flood year, whether it was a drought year, or whether it was a year that was just good for growth. So we have three different categories of, uh, derived from the hydrograph. Okay, and then there's also some rate of self-thinning. So individuals are gonna die just because uh, stands become crowded and then, and then they thin out. And finally, fecundity is basically what I showed you in that recruitment box model. That if, it's, if it happens to be a flood year and the timing is correct and the flood recession rate uh, is correct, um, then you're gonna have reproduction. Okay, so, so these things are gonna set seed and it's gonna cover those bare substrates and you're gonna get a new uh, stand of seedlings developing. Um, well, you can do the exact same thing that we did for cottonwood, and by the way, that, that first cottonwood model is kind of old news now. We published that seven years ago, but right as we speak, we're developing a new model that includes tamarisk so we can look at their relative competitive ability. 
Uh, so we're taking the same approach, but cottonwood has sort of a different uh, life stage structure here. So we have these different classes, seedlings, uh, year two, year three to six here. But by year three to six, they already re become reproductively active. So those can produce seeds already at that early age. Whereas cottonwood, you have to wait basically until year 10. And all of these successive stages can also produce seeds. So slightly different life history, slightly different dynamics. And the thing I want to point out is that in this model, we have tamarisk and cottonwood uh, not competing directly for space. So we're modeling them in the same landscape, and the seedlings can coexist in mixed stands, but we have not invoked any particular kind of competition except that there's a finite amount of space that any riparian tree can occupy. So there's sort of indirect competition for the general amount of space that's available. And we denote that by the variable k. And just a little bit about how, how we deal with space here, too. It's kind of, kind of an unusual way of doing it, but, uh, but it actually uh, works pretty well from a modeling point of view. So space and population size are inter interchangeable in this model. Okay, so we know that if you go out and measure a, a seedling stand of cottonwood, that they're going to exist at a certain dis density. I think it's something like 350 stems per meter squared is typically what you get. And then as those age up into year one or year two, they thin out at a very characteristic rate. So even though they're occupying the same amount of area, uh, the number of stems per unit area is going to be changing. So if we know that relationship, we can go from space to population size just by multiplying. Okay, so space and population size are interchangeable here. And it seems a little counterintuitive, but essentially this makes the model spatially implicit. So we're keeping track of the relative amount of space covered by any given species or any given stage, but we don't have to keep track of where every individual is. And here are just some general model outputs for the cottonwood only model. So if you run a typical uh, run, what we're doing is drawing years at random from a hydrograph for the Yampa River. And uh, the dynamics are going to be driven to a large degree by that. And so what you have up the top is the, the space, the proportion of the, t the total space that can be occupied by cottonwood, which is 100% right there, that's actually occupied by, by plants. You see it, go, it bounces up and down. It's a very stochastic process. And here we have the dynamics of the individual stages. And right here, we have dynamics of mature cottonwood forest. So by the time you get to those older stage classes, the dynamics are a little more a little more regular. You still see these sort of uh, these cycles that occur on a 10 to 15 year periodicity right here. And it turns out that those cycles are driven by a very particular phenomenon that's pretty well known in cottonwood biology. And that is for the best recruitment years, that occurs when you have a big flood event right here, followed by a handful of years that are not flood years, so you're not wiping out seedlings that established in previous years, but they're years that are good for growth. So you have good flood year, maybe two, three good growth years, and then you get a very strong stand that's in one of the later stages that are more resistant to flooding. So even if flooded floods come along a little bit later then, those individuals are less likely to get removed from the system. And that's when you start to see you know, the, the adult population size or the size or the number of mature cottonwoods increase. So these are these big pulses that come through with this regular periodicity. Just because the stars align just right, to get a good recruitment year followed by good growth years. So we were happy to kind of recover that from first principles because it's a well-known feature of cottonwood biology. So you could take a model like that and play with it and ask questions such as, okay, if you want to grow cottonwoods, if you want to manage for cottonwood gallery forest, which is one of the big objectives on the Bill Williams River. Okay, in fact, by some estimates, there are more cottonwoods growing on the Bill Williams now than there were since the Pleistocene. Okay, so they're being actively managed for this feature because of, because of the importance of the wildlife. Well, it turns out you can do better than a natural flood regime. Okay, so this is for the Yampa River right here, but the natural flood frequency on the Yampa River is something like between 15 and 55% of years are going to have some kind of flood that meets our threshold requirements for recruitment. Well, the sort of average cottonwood forest uh, abundance you're going to get here is going to be you know somewhere in between 40 and 50 percent here but if you actually 
ramp that back and lower flood frequency, so move over this way on the axis, you can actually have a higher proportion of the habitat occupied by mature cottonwood forest. Okay? And you can do even better than that if you carefully dole out how that water occurs. So if you have a good recruitment year followed by several good growth years. So you can actually sort of fine tune the natural hydrograph to a degree where you overproduce cottonwood in excess of what you would expect nature to do. And in a sense, that's what's being done in a few river systems. Okay, so now let's add tamarisk to the mix. Okay, so this is the two species model. So none of, this is all brand new stuff here. None of this is published. Um, and I'm going to show you a number of different model runs here. So essentially we have the percent of habitat occupied by the two species. Under natural flow regime conditions, this is basically what you get. If you start out with pure cottonwoods, and you invade it with a, a handful of uh, tamarisk seedlings. Uh, you see them slowly establish. There'll be some good years, and then they make their way in here. And there's some sort of equilibrium between the two species where it's about a 50 50 split between cottonwood and tamarisk. Okay. And again, it's some of the same flood dynamics are driving the recruitment and the mortality of both of these species, but their life histories are a little bit different. If you play with the hydrograph and you increase the frequency of drought years and decrease the number of floods, tamarisk seems to do disproportionately better than cottonwood. And this is well known. It's thought that in a drying climate or in situations where water is over allocated, one of the reasons tamarisk really takes off is that it just does better under those drought conditions than cottonwood does. So this is pretty well known. Also, the other interesting thing here is that when you add these things, two things together, the overall amount of riparian vegetation not surprising because you're taking water out of the system. And finally, here's a management scenario. This, this one was actually a surprise to me. Suppose you impose a management uh, decision where you have very frequent recruitment floods with the, with the idea that you want to favor lots of establishment of cottonwood. Um, and you eliminate drought from the system, so you make it really favorable for growth. Well, you know, this excessively favors tamarisk. <coughs> Tamarisk populations are really strong and stable and quite dominant. Uh, and the reason for that is that the age to maturity for, for tamarisk is much earlier than that for cottonwood. Okay? So they can exploit the high frequency of flooding uh, and the recruitment that results from that to a much larger degree than cottonwood can. So eventually they sort of force cottonwood abundances down. Okay? So kind of a little bit of a counterintuitive result right there. But when you go back and examine the life histories of these two species, it makes sense. I think I'll just skip that one. And so finally, here's sort of that, that holy grail uh, scenario that I alluded to earlier. If you, if you shift the timing of the floods so that you're outside that window when uh, tamar seeds are normally present, in theory, uh, even though a few kind of floods escaped here, uh, just because they were at the extreme end of the distribution, and there was a little bit of uh, tamarisk recruitment. At some point, in theory, you can remove tamarisk from the system. But I'm showing, you know, this is a theoretical graph. I think under most natural conditions, this almost never happens, mainly because there's always tamarisk there that will survive, okay? So it's almost impossible to remove them by flooding. And uh, secondarily, there's always gonna be, you know, always gonna be seed present, no matter what you do and how precisely you time that. So that's, this is kind of the pie in the sky graph. I don't really consider this a realistically achievable scenario, but may, there may be some hope for reducing the relative abundances of the two by using the right flow prescriptions. So just to summarize that part, um, so these two species equilibrate even under natural flow regime conditions. I mean, we know that empirically, we can see that in models. Um, there can be unintended effects of managing for cottonwood recruitment simply because the dynamics of these two species are so similar. And finally, you know, this idea of eliminating tamarisk via carefully timed floods, it's theoretically possible, but uh, I think probably very difficult to achieve in the real world. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm gonna totally shift gears here, and no, I'm not gonna just start talking about my kids, all right? But, um, I want you to imagine, this is a more evolutionary scenario, that imagine that you uh, are going for a hike with your kids and you're in some narrow slot canyon. And you remember, I study flash floods and, and uh, the fitness consequences of flash floods. 
So, uh, you know, there's your fitness right there. And you're deep in this canyon, and suddenly it starts to rain a little bit. And you look up, and you can sort of see the sky, but not too well. And then it starts to rain harder. Well, what are the things that go through your head? You think, well, okay, you know, I'm down here in this narrow canyon. If there's a flood, we'd probably all be in trouble. On the other hand, if it's a false alarm and I just leave too quickly, then uh, you know, I'm going to ruin a perfectly good hike, and my kids are going to be really angry at me. So I've got to judge the situation and judge the environment very carefully. So it turns out that for some aquatic insects, as I, as I showed you before, when they receive rainfall, it's a very particular cue that a certain consequence is going to happen. And depending on how predictable that cue is, uh, they can evolve a different behavioral strategy uh, in response to that. And that's what I'm going to show you next. So we're moving out of these large floodplain rivers and we're up in more small montane headwater streams that are populated by this animal. This is a giant water bug, Abetus herberti. And they're interesting because they're flightless and uh, we know that they use rainfall as their primary cue to escape flash floods. They essentially leave the stream once they're sufficiently convinced that a flood is going to occur. And rather than talk a lot about the behavior, uh, I'll show you a short video right here. So this is a, an actual population in the canyon. I'm there during a, a rainstorm, so I'm holding an umbrella and a camera, so it's all a little bit shaky. But the, but the rain is hitting there really hard. The, the, the stream's starting to come up. And this pool, which is full of giant water bugs, at some point, after about 15 minutes of that rain, they start crawling out of that pool and climbing straight up the bedrock faces of the canyon. And they always go laterally away from the stream and they find the steepest place they can climb. And as long as rainfall is hitting them, they'll climb directly up one of those sheer rock faces and crawl up to safety. And here, this one, I think, gets about three or four meters above the water, so it's going to be safe from any kind of flood that could come through afterwards. They'll get wedged into the bedrock, and then uh, the next day, if you do a mark recapture study, you'll see that the same individuals are right back in the stream as when you started. Okay, so clearly they have this behavior for escaping floods. And that explains to some degree why their mortality rates are fairly low. And so the question is, can disturbance predictability uh, evolve in different populations of this water bug? Or, or can, they, can they evolve in response to predictability? Well, it turns out that these different decisions that one might make in order to uh, uh, sort of process the information that you're getting from the, from the environment is nicely encapsulated by this body of theory. This is signal detection theory. And this goes back to uh, Shannon and Weaver's work in the 40s on uh, optimal sending of signals over telephone wires. So essentially, um, what you have is you're balancing a signal to noise ratio. So you have some event which could be a rainfall of duration x. And then you have some probability or, or a distribution that describes the probability that that rainfall event is actually going to cause a flood. So that signal, that's what you want out of the environment. You want to know if something's going to happen. But then you have noise. So there's another probability distribution. And these are all the events that might be long rainfall events, but they result in nothing actually happening. So those are the, the, that's the noise or the false alarms. So the first part of this is essentially a signal-to-noise ratio. Well, that signal-to-noise ratio in the, uh, in the environment, it turns out, is balanced by the other side of the equation, which essentially describes various costs and benefits of, leave, of doing different behaviors. So C is the cost of leaving a stream. So if you leave a stream, you, you might get eaten by a bird, or you might not find your way back and dry out. So there's some cost. On the other hand, if you stay, you're going, to be get, you're going to get caught in a flood. And we know that that cost is somewhere above 95% for most taxa in these streams. And then finally, there's just the prior probability of a flood. Like how frequent are floods in, in environments? Well, we set out to measure this across a whole series of populations of giant water bugs. And it turns out that they're distributed all throughout southeast Arizona, uh, down into Sonora. Uh, we've identified well over 40 populations, and we've done a little bit of genetic work just to show that these, yes, they are individually or, or, or more or less isolated units uh, evolving on their own trajectories, just some basic mitochondrial DNA. And uh, now we're doing some microsatellites to fine tune that, but basically these are evolutionarily independent units. And 
Essentially, catchment size works this way. So some of these are in little small catchments where they're in little springs up perched at the top of a, a mountain range, and others, other populations occupy much larger areas. And essentially, you can imagine that in these really small catchments, floods are just going to be rare. There's hardly any evidence of flash flooding. And so rain is going to have low information that a flood's going to occur, simply because floods don't occur. You go to the big size catchments, well, floods may be common, but very often the rainfall that's causing it may occur up here or up here or up here in some very remote part of the catchment. So there's not a lot of information there necessarily either. But in these middle-sized catchments, uh, you tend to have the highest correlation between the Q, which is rainfall, and the consequence. And so that's where we would expect information to be the highest. Uh, so a little bit of phylogeographic data that I'm not going to go into. Essentially what we did are lots and lots of behavioral trials. We went out and found 15 populations spanning a huge diversity of catchment size. Uh, we ran in our rainfall simulator uh, for our trials going up to an hour and essentially scored how many individuals responded and how many minutes it took them to be convinced. And this is a lot of data because you know we're talking close to 40 individuals per population. Uh, we did multiple trials per individual. And so what we got out of all of this is for each population, the minutes of rainfall required to convince an individual in that population to leave, okay? And we call that response time. And then the percentage of the population that responds. So that's sort of the, the, the proportion of individuals that actually show the behavior. And I cannot overemphasize how important and how fun doing all the field work to get these populations is. If I could just go collect water bug populations in remote canyons throughout Mexico and Arizona for the rest of my life, I will happily do so. And luckily, there seem to be many, many populations that I have not found. So uh, just a little plug for field work there. So here's what we found. So essentially, if you look at catchment size down here, and this is a log scale. So we're going from really tiny catchments to really huge ones. Response time had basically this U-shaped curve right here. Okay. So the individuals from the smallest catchment size refuse to come out of the water no matter how much rainfall we give them. They did not believe a flood is going to occur. And in their world, floods do not occur. So they've lost this behavior entirely. On the other hand, in these mid-sized catchments, individuals were much quicker to leave the water. And the proportion of the population responding was much higher right down here. Okay. These are I consider these outlier points here that normally I would discuss, and they're kind of kind of interesting in their own way, but I don't think there's going to be time to do that, so I can discuss that later. But essentially, the general pattern is that mid-sized catchments favor a quick response time and sort of a higher penetrance of the behavior throughout the population. Okay, so this appears to be an evolved response uh, to the information content of the environment at a population level. Okay. So I really only have to the hour here, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and skip over a, a few little things here. So we actually used data that we obtained from an experimental watershed where they've been measuring rainfall events at two minute intervals since the 1950s. And we're able to put together profiles for that signal to noise ratio for small, medium, and large catchments. And these are the data right here, but what I'm gonna show you is what happens when we plug that back into the signal detection theory. So of all those parameters, actually, um, of all those parameters in signal detection theory, we had all of them except the cost of leaving the stream. We just could never measure it. You know, we tried several years and couldn't get it. So what I'm showing you here are the predictions under different values of that cost. So here it's low, here it's medium, here it's a little bit higher. And our actual empirical data suggests that, uh, for, first of all, that uh, there's a pretty good fit here in terms of the general shape of the data, in terms of it has this sort of this U shape right here, but it also suggests the cost, the maximum likelihood estimate is essentially 0.6. So that's something that at some point in the future we want to measure, but um, essentially just the fact that our data even show up on this plot here, I think is, is kind of a success that there's a pretty good fit between the model and the data. So we have catchment area here, response time there. It's a reasonably good fit there, although there's one parameter we did not measure. So just to summarize that, 
Um, based on this study, uh, the information content of the environment predicts the phenotype that you observe. And that's kind of unusual. You don't think of evolution in response to something as abstract as an information content of an environment. But, but there it is. There's, uh, in some places, it's a real strong connection. In some places, it's weaker. And evolution acts on that, just like it would on any other selective agent. Um, the common garden behavioral experience, we did suggest local adaptation. And to some degree, the genetics suggests uh, that, that, that the time scales are sufficient for that to happen. And so you can imagine with heritable variation and strong selection, uh, you can have populations of other kinds of organisms adapting to the different flow regimes that they experience. So I think that this is, we were able to study it in this very modular system, but I think that this is going on in, in flow regimes and rivers and streams all around us. It's just harder to get a handle on. Okay. So what does this all mean in a world that's, that's completely loaded up with dams and flow diversions and modifications natural flow regimes. Well, just overall, I, I think that this abiotic approach that we've been taking for these uh, different organisms, they do go a long way towards explaining the basic dynamics in flowing water ecosystems. And that's because flow regime really is the master variable uh, that drives a lot of the biological processes, especially in desert rivers or rivers in semi-arid regions. Okay, so they're very abiotic places to begin with. So it's not surprising that abiotic models would be um, I think we can exploit uh, timing and magnitude, especially of prescribed floods, to achieve certain environmental goals, such as favoring certain taxa over, over others, uh, not native over non native species, and so on. But in some cases, these out outcomes are going to be very complex and probably will require some biotic mo um, modeling of species interactions. And finally, uh, as the water bug work shows, Populations can evolve in response to flow regimes. Okay? And I see this as a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, we can see populations adjusting to post-dam flows. So as we change hydrographs, uh, there may be some evolution in response to that. And so, so the organisms accommodate that. On the other hand, they may shift over uh, to some different state and in some cases lose the ability uh, to have be behaviors for surviving extreme flows. As we saw, there was that one population where that trait evolved away, and we don't know if that can ever be recovered. And so that's sort of the game that we're playing on a large scale with managed rivers and streams. So a lot of these questions remain unanswered. And with that, I want to thank a lot of people and a lot of generous funding agencies, and I will take any questions that you have. data on this, but this is sort of a suggestion that's out there among cottonwood biologists, that if you look at different populations of cottonwood, that there's more fine scale adjustment of the timing of seed release in response to when flood pulses come down the pipe on their particular river. Because as you can imagine, sometimes these events are occurring really far away. So the floods that might cause uh, scouring and then recruitment can be different depending on where the snowpack is and how high up it is. But supposedly there might be some evolved responses to that. So if that's the case, then I could imagine for a species such as tamarisk, uh, that the same kind of thing could happen. Uh, again, we don't know that to be certain for cottonwood. At least I haven't seen any hard data on that. But, but that's something I'd like to know more about. Because uh, it, it, theoretically it's possible. You would think microevolution would occur at that scale. But, 
again, that's in the realm of speculation. Is there evidence for anticipatory seed release? So maybe during El Nino year, you release your seeds at a different time. Like oh. Um, I don't know about among year types, but in, in a sense, all the seed release is anticipatory, right? And that, that they sort of set seed at a certain time, I believe, even if the floods don't arrive. So um, I don't know if there's any fine scale adjustment on the part of the cottonwoods in terms of allocating effort towards seed set. If there really isn't much of a, of a flood, I haven't heard anything about that, but they will set seed every year. So it's sort of constitutive. Yes. I was impressed with the amount of local variation in the Phyclos water style, Phyclos uh, uh, water water that is. Yeah. But of course, presumably this is all post Pleistocene. Things were totally different. I mean, so it suggests um, a lot of this could be sort of wiped out during during glacial events and then it sort of resets itself. Is that, is that sort of scenario you have in mind? We've, in fact, we've observed uh, local extinctions of what we believe to be fairly old populations <coughs> in recent years. Uh, in, in Arizona, in the early 2000s, there were some very extensive droughts that went on for some time. And I think that, coupled with groundwater pumping, changes in land use, uh, we saw a lot of uh, otherwise perennial <coughs> habitats fail and transition over to a more intermittent uh, type of system. And that, that seems to be the state for at least a few of the study sites that we've been looking at. And, we, and the water bugs disappeared. So they, they went locally extinct. And um, you know, whether they can show up again from other places and kind of re-evolve those phenotypes, we, we don't know. But um, clearly, it's, it's certainly a dynamic system in that sense. But, but given the divergence times of some of these populations, we, we actually think they're, they're quite old. Uh, so they've been stable for a long time, so it was surprising to us to actually observe in real time uh, local extinctions, because I don't think that's a normal thing. But there must have been quite different flows <coughs> during the Pleistocene. There must have been very different flow situations in the Pleistocene. I'm just, I'm just curious. Yes, yes. Um, uh, certainly around there, there were a lot of basin lakes that probably, if anything, would have been barriers for dispersal across, uh, you know, larger divides and into, into other drainages. And we, from the phylogeographic data, we see some signal of that. Uh, ironically, most of, the, most of the evidence that we have for, for migration, which you know, indirect evidence from the genetic data, suggests that individuals are more likely to climb over a mountain range into the next drainage than they are to move down within their own drainage to a population much further down. So we have a few populations that are up in the mountains and there may be a Sienega much lower down, 20, 30 kilometers away. Uh, they're more different from each other than those headwater populations are across the divide. So it was kind of a surprising uh, result that we got. But you know, they're, they're, they're clearly a headwater specialist in general, and they sort of behave more like frogs. I mean, and that they are able to move terrestrially and colonize new habitats that way. Uh, in fact, they're long alive. They live about uh, upwards of three years, and they're heteroparous. You know, they'll produce multiple not not too typical for aquatic insects. Yes, Neil. So thinking about the the long term effect of the dam change on the regime, a lot of the work you're talking about is saying it's sort of removing the effect of interspecific competition and interaction, seeing as a highly disturbance driven system. So the dams are presumably changing that. Do you, do, do, do you speculate or see like? A massive shift in life history or community competition towards species that are more competition structured. I mean, basically having a, a more homogeneous temporal environment. Is that is that likely or so a shift towards a more biotically dominated yeah, exactly. world because we're it's not the easier model, but it seems like a, a, a one step back way of looking at you know community disassembly and assembly sort of. Uh, you know, th that's a good point. So as we homogenize those flow regimes, the modeling approach that I'm advocating here actually gets less and less relevant because well, probably biotic well, things will exceed. Put it quite that. <laughs> <laughs> I hear what you're yeah, saying. Sorry. <laughs> but sort of including some of those that makes sense for predicting the longer term. I, I think that's true. I mean, you know, these, these are really simple models. And I think where, when you run them and, and, you, and you look at the results, I think where you get traction 
is when you're you're seeing a lot of events happen one after the other, big floods, big droughts. Um, when you remove those disturbance events, the uh, the predictions sort of sort of veer back towards a default state where we're not really gaining much information. I mean, we know we set those parameters at a certain number, and we know we're heading right back to that state because you know the model forces it that way. But there could be a whole other layer of biotic interactions that begin to become more and more important there. And others have, you know, this is not a new idea. I mean, if you, you know, look at other people, you know, Mary Powers' work with, with flooding, I mean, you know, clearly there's, there's this biotic effect of flooding differentially affecting some organisms, but then biological interactions that are really important too. So that clearly occurs. But I think for looking at uh, these management scenarios where your job is to send a flood down, and you want to know how many and how big, uh, just to get a basic understanding of what's likely to happen, uh, probably starting with those bio abiotic effects is the first cut, and then looking at the biotic effects that intercede later is the second cut. But, yeah. We'll probably have to cut questions off at this point, but uh, feel free to talk to Dave at any point. Um, and, uh,